All right, Maggie. Well, today we're talking about categories. I would say our, our discussion today will probably be a little bit meandering and, and maybe difficult to follow because I picked a very wonky topic. Um, Indeed you did. Today. It's more like it's more like categories. <laughs> we're all over yeah. the place. <laughs> but we're going to talk about category definitions and why it's important that businesses have kind of a clear shared understanding of what their category is and how they're going to optimize their strategy to reach that category. So it's a little bit of a, a deep dive into, you know, uh, a kind of niche topic, but it's really important for big brands that are spending a lot of money um, and to make sure everyone on the team has alignment about how they're spending that money. So we hope you enjoy. All right. So Maggie, I picked I picked a kind of a nebulous, difficult topic to talk about today. <laughs> but I think <laughs> it's an excellent way to kick off 2023 with a difficult and nebulous topic. Like That's why not dive in like dive in head first? <laughs> yeah. It's <laughs> it's uh, it's a good time to 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 talk about things we don't really understand and where we're going and that are confusing. But I think it's a very important topic for researchers and I think it's a it is an important topic for marketers as well. And, um, you know, we, we sometimes, even though we talk every day, we, we do have kind of different client bases and, and you have, uh, what I would call more traditional clients. And I probably spend more time with techie or younger companies. Let's put it that way, young, younger companies. And, um, one of the things that I've really, really noticed happening a lot more over the last couple of years is. This idea of, of, you know, traditionally what we would call category, right? Like, um, which I, you know, I'll try to loosely define is that the space in which a brand plays, right? Like, and traditionally, you know, some companies, you know, tr some companies might have had an easier time deciding what their category is, right? Like if you um, are a company that makes, let's, let's think of it good, simple. Let's, let's take trucks, right? If you're a company that makes trucks, then you might have thought of your category traditionally as, you know, people that need a truck for work, uh, which historically was mostly kind of how trucks were. And, and maybe you had like a, some bounds placed on that, right? Like, Hey, the typical truck buyer is a 20 to 50 year old, you know, consumer that is 70% male and 30% female and, you know, 80% have uh, a job that requires, you know, moving things. <laughs> but, but I think that's a super high tech term for it. Job yeah. in which we move things, <laughs> moving things, things that are on the move. But I mean, I think, you know, when, when I, I feel old sometimes, but you know, it, it, traditionally in, in, in marketing and then in, in research, companies had a pretty strong shared definition of what their category was. This is, and they you know, they'd have cute words for it. They might have like, you know, a personification of it, or they might have, you know, a segmentation obviously um, is, is, is almost a must have, but you know, the traditional world, you had these two foundational pieces of research, right? You had your A and your A and U and your segmentation and your A and U uh, cover the, the category and, and then when you see covering the category, it would be like, all right, for, for our buyers, you know, what's our brand share? Like what percent buy our truck versus a competitor's truck? Uh, what's the reason those people buy that truck? Um, what do they, you know, we're, we're considered a better value or we're considered like, you know, more performance, but, but you could ask pretty much anyone in marketing at that company, what their category was. And, 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 you know, probably who their target was inside that category. And you'd get the same answer. Right. Basically. And they also knew who the competitors were too, right? <laughs> exactly. And they knew and there was like a shared, and, and by the way, when I said when I'm talking about the past, this is still the case at, at traditional companies, right? Companies right. have been around a long time. I, I can say, what's your category? How do you define it? Where's the boundaries? Um, and who's your target and who's your, and they might, they, you know, you could ask 20 people at the company and they'd have a pretty shared answer right yeah. like, like if, if not a remarkably precise answer of a, you know like <laughs> i just remember Maybe like in the ballpark at least yeah <laughs> yeah because you know it's this kind of stuff gets really really tricky right like um you know and, and it's and a lot of this just comes from if you play in a certain space um 
you know that space super well, right? If you sell trucks, you know exactly what people want in a truck. Um, truck's an interesting one too, because that's changed so much over the last 10 years. Like I'm, it's always amazing to me how, how trucks now are, it seems to be primarily bought by people that don't need them. Um, right. Well, so see, even their category is, is shifting. <laughs> Wait, whose category is shifting? But even truck categories are shifting, right? Because no, there's people shifting, them. Like, it's insane. Yeah. It, it's really amazing. You know, it's been, it's wild. Uh, it is one of the funniest things to me always whenever you go out of America to just look at cars and then you look at American cars and it's just like, it's crazy how big our cars are. <laughs> ours keep are. getting bigger and theirs keep getting smaller. <laughs> yeah. And um, so, so, okay. So this, I said, this is a little bit of a nebulous topic and I think it's an interesting discussion, but if you, if you were to ask 20 people at a, uh, let's, let's call it a tech first company. <laughs> um a lot of them don't even know what the question means. If I say mm-hmm. which category, um, and they don't know who their target is, and of course, if people don't, if if people haven't had this discussion before, the the gut response is everyone, right? Like everyone wants to see, like, oh, God, my category is everyone, um, and everyone wants to see their target as everyone, um, and I think it's it's a really interesting thing that's happening here. I find I find myself in this in this kind of um, situation a lot where I'm like, no, no, you don't you don't want your category to be everyone, and you definitely yeah. don't want your target to be everyone, you know, because it it's it's like a it's a little bit of a red flag to me of like, why wow, you haven't thought this through at all, right? Like, um, I was gonna say I had this interesting conversation. Um, it was during it was during the pandemic and uh, shipping times were were a big issue, and I was talking to one of our what I would consider a traditional retail client um, who does direct to consumer mailings of their product. And their biggest competitor is often um, Amazon. And what she said to me was, there's just no way I can compete because I was set up as a retail company. I have a product that I deliver to a very specific consumer, but Amazon is set up as a shipping company. And so like from a logistical standpoint, that that's what they do. They can ship anything to anyone. Um, and, you know, like it's, it's a, it's a, it was striking to me, not in that, you know, not so much the category slide piece of it, but this idea of like two companies selling similar products, but the way that they target their consumers is 100% different. And the, the things that drive them to their strategic decisions would also be really, really different, even though at the end of the day, they're both delivering this. CPG product. Um, and, and I think it's just that that framework is so different for a traditional retail company versus, you know, a tech driven retail company. And, and I think about that a lot when I'm thinking about like the problems that some of our traditional clients face versus the more tech forward clients. Um, yeah. And it, it's Amazon's an interesting example because the way, um, I don't know if you've seen, you probably haven't seen that. Do you know that Sheen company? I don't know if I'm saying it correctly. S-H-E-I-N. I don't. That's one of the fastest, fastest growing companies on the planet. But 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 they, I they, know it then. <laughs> but it's interesting to see how there's there's companies popping up now that are that are are kind of built to compete with Amazon and the way they do it is interesting. Because because Amazon also is like um they're such a, a beast, but they're not there there is actually a good example for this discussion a lot of times. It's not clear exactly what their goal is right like right. um or what their position is it's it's kind of everything and everyone um they're a little bit different though because they're there it's different than a you know like a a brand that's playing in, in something like an automotive or food or beverage or something like that where your positioning is is um a lot more crowded and and it's more important that you know exactly what you're kind of going after but it'll be interesting to see like if you just if you take like a long-term view of it a lot of times when when categories are new, which basically most tech companies are, are you know, at, at least at the very least a reinvention of a an older category that that, that people think of as a new category. Um, but it, when everything's new, it's kind of novel. And then, of course, there's always competition always comes to any opportunity, right? So as these spaces get more and more competitive, we're going to see, you know, we're going to have to see s- some companies learn to do um marketing and branding really well to succeed right and then the ultimate example of this obviously to me is apple right there's apple is, is a tech company that understands brand um and it's 
it's so it's so rare and it's so difficult um, for a lot of of companies to understand. Um, it's hard it's hard for them to see. They get this kind of performance mindset of like, can they see the immediate payoff of any investment? Right. Um, mm -hmm. I don't. And, do you think the and, Apple one works well because it was so? Mission driven is not the right word, but they had sort of a singular focus in the beginning and that that's played through well, or do you think that there's something else at play that makes that one a tech company that does brand well? Some people would scoff at this response, but, but I do think that, that, you know, Steve Jobs was not really a techie first, right? He, right. he loved it enough, but he understood it, you know, cause some of these companies, it's, it's just in their DNA. If the fact like Nike did a lot of things that you know, Nike and Apple and Disney are the, are the, the three companies that stand out to me always. Um, I mean, you could throw Coke and Pepsi in there too, but mm -hmm. you, you, there's, there's certain companies that stand out. as just like they, from, from day one, they were building a brand. Yeah. Um, well, it was, I mean, doing a lot of other things. It was design know. driven, right? And so that thread carries through Yeah, that every thing. product. Yeah. It's funny. I saw this, um, this, I, I'm, a, I'm like addicted to Twitter as you already know, but for people that are listening, <laughs> I'm on Twitter all day long. And there was this, uh, there was this Twitter thread the other day where this person had gone back. Um, I actually don't know exactly how they did this, but, but it, it involved like magazines and, and paper from the seventies, but this person went back and found, um, early Nike ads. Um, mm -hmm. and it was really interesting because like, you could tell by looking at them, that they were um, they were laid out by hand, you know what I mean. So 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 they didn't. It, it was really fascinating. They didn't necessarily uh, have. We're we're so used to everything today looks so polished. Everything's you know exactly symmetrical and perfectly centered. And they they didn't have. It was they were they were in the back of like running magazines. I assume they didn't really say where yeah. they got them. They just this person cut out a bunch of these early ads, and they um, they posted them on Twitter. They just took pictures of them. And it was really fascinating to look at because the design obviously was nothing like we're, you know, like throughout much of my life, Nike ads have been so polished and so just, yeah. just so well done. And, 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 but the thing that was fascinating is you could see these early ads, they were typeset, but it, so much of the core, like what they're communicating, like was so similar to what it is today. Like yeah. it was really fascinating to see is like what they have from day one, they have, first of all, the athlete is definitely first, right? Like there, there's, the ad wasn't like, hey, you should buy this shoe because it's got this specific thing. It was, right. you should run another mile when you think you can't. Like it was, right. it, was it was all targeted at runners, the stuff I saw. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's where all their early advertising was from what yeah. I can tell. Um, but um it was so interesting. And I think Apple kind of had that too, because even before the iPhone, everybody's like, oh, Apple just invented this amazing project. And then, but it's funny, if you look at the campaigns they had, you know, obviously that Mac campaign is one of the most iconic ads of all time. Right. It was this, this the think different idea that like, that was just like from the beginning. And I think in those cases, since the founder understood where they wanted to go, the company went there, even though some of those expenditures... <clears throat> Um, probably made no sense, right? Like, like you, you're just like, wait, you're going to pay this much to put this ad here? Um, and in the end, they came out with these iconic brands that they now, you know, like obviously as you fast forward, as the company gets bigger, it's much more strategic in terms of we can extend the brand into this category or not. You know, we, we, we're going to go from running to shoes. But I think that's something that as as a lot of these tech companies are going to have to have to really rethink, like if you have to pick a shared target between marketing and, and, and product and like all the different people that are working in different capacities. If, if, if there's not a shared vision for who we're going after and how we're going after them and why we're going after them, it seems like it would, it would be hard to succeed. Like you're still going to, you're still going to be like, yeah. you know, chasing, but, but in a performance mindset, you know, like it's, 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 it, I think about this a lot in marketing that, and this is going to, it's not just going to be marketing. This is going to be a lot of life, right? As things, as, as you get more and more like machine learning, there's things that work that nobody knows why they work, right? And that's right. true of a lot of marketing. <laughs> there's, a, there's a lot of stuff of, we spent, you know, some money over here and we got this 
return, but no one can tell you exactly why that worked, right? right. Which is fine. I mean, that's that's just the world we live in. But if that's the primary expenditures and the primary way you do business, it's it seems really, really hard to then build a brand on top of that, right? Like it's 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 like you have this scattershot approach that that brings some things back. But long term, it's the brand that's going to get you over the hump, I think, right? Like, yeah. not, not, not necessarily yeah. for everybody, right? I think consumers want to be able to connect with a brand, right? And so in order to connect with a brand, it has to stand for something. And whether that's, you know, if you, from a, from the, you know, like when we did the um, path to purpose, right? In, in that case, it's like consumers wanted to be able to identify the mission. And if they could understand the mission, then they could buy into that mission and feel good about that purchase. On a different level, I think brands have that sort of responsibility or goal too, right? You want to know what it stands for. So if you, you know, if we talk about a Disney or an Apple or a um, Nike, like, you know what it stands for, even if you don't exactly always understand how each product ties back to that sort of core essence of the brand, like you still get what the brand's about. So if you're as a, you know, as a consumer, if I can't like really pinpoint what a brand is, I think you're less likely to be loyal to it. And so like, even if I still need the product it's providing, if someone else comes along with the same product or same offering, I'm more likely to try it out because I haven't like really connected with who this brand is. And so I think that's the that's the part where the strategy and the research becomes super important because if you can't tell people who and what you are, why in the world would they invest in helping you continue to build that brand? It's, it's too nebulous. Like you, in, in some way you need to connect to the brands that you're buying. And, you know, I think that that level of connectivity is very different across categories or at different price points and things like that. Like I don't need to connect as strongly with like my, I don't know, the frozen peas I buy as I might with the car I own or something like that. But there's still a continuum of, I want to, I want to feel good about what I'm investing my money in. And so I want to know what it stands for on some level. Yeah. It's interesting that you bring up the mission driven thing, because obviously the mission driven thing is, is another angle on this that's kind of different, right? But it's, it achieves the same purpose, right? Like, right. like we were talking before about trucks, right? So Tesla is an interesting example, right? Now Tesla very early on did a great job of establishing that they have a mission, right? And, and that all decisions are going to be done by the mission. And um, I'm trying to remember, like I, you, I, I don't remember this, but in, in like in path to purpose, I, I think Tesla's in the top 10 for sure, right? Maybe in the top five. I, have, I should look that up. I don't remember exactly, I, but I know they're, they're up there. I think it does well. Um, yeah. Relatively speaking. Although it's obviously polarizing for some people, but it's interesting if you, they have a mission, which is clearly described and, and, uh, well understood, I think by most people, people may disagree with it. Like it, it, it obviously it's very polarizing. And, um, my wife and I were talking about this last night. It's so easy for things to become polarizing now and (laughs) and not just like slightly polarizing, but, but like really polarizing. I, Uh, I think that's an entirely different topic that we can talk about is like why we're so polarized right now, but I agree with you. <laughs> it actually is a fascinating topic because I, I think we could do a whole podcast on this gas stove thing, which to me is the-, the Oh my gosh, fascinating. I mean, it's fascinating, fascinating to me that like out of nowhere, people are arguing about stoves. Like who, who like I'll bet you half the people arguing about stoves haven't used one in the last month. <laughs> My favorite today was, what did I read today? It was like, but cavemen have been using fire to cook food from the beginning of time. Like, why would we get rid of our... <laughs> it's crazy. Our, it, it, it does have, like, the, <laughs> I will say, like, uh, it, I mean, one of my kids has asthma, and I, it kind of blew me away that they could trace 13% of asthma cases to stoves. I was like, really? That is huge. And it, But it, I, my first thought was like, why aren't we just making better stoves? Like, do we... <laughs> I don't know. Maybe that's... Not the right question, but it's like, seems like there could be a way to like reduce the. Well, the industry ones are the better stuff. That's what I like. That's what it, it kind of is. And I, it's funny because I, we just recently, just like a month ago, we were at this friend's house and they just redid their kitchen and they had an induction oven. And I was, they were like, have you seen one of these things before? And I was like, no, I haven't really. And we were, they were it's playing, crazy. showing me it was, it was actually really wild. I was like, you can touch it. Your hand doesn't get hot, but the water 
instantly. Anyhow, let's. Sorry, we got we got way. I got I got us off yeah. track. You can't even <laughs> stay on category. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Let's, yeah, we got to stay on track. But let's go back to the Tesla thing for a second because I think this is a really interesting example of mission driven. Is is and and a very like a very clear clearly articulated mission, but not a real clear category strategy. Right. Right. Like, and it's, it's really interesting to co- contrast them with traditional auto who pursues a very, um, what I would call, I mean, I, it's funny. They don't, they do. I, I, I'm, I'm guessing a little bit here because I don't do a lot of automotive work, but, but it's more category driven. We're going to make, you know, this yeah. subcontact for this or subcompact, sorry, um, for this, you know, suburban mom who needs this like um and i think that i think the way that elon musk talks about marketing is indicative of how a lot of people think about marketing right like a lot of people in tech think about marketing where he's like it's this 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 proud he's very proud of the fact that they've never spent a dollar on marketing um and from one angle you're like yeah wow you've sold all every car you can make without having to spend a dollar on marketing like as a business you're like oh that's great um but you do wonder, like, that's kind of an early stage thing to be proud of, right? Like, eventually, yeah. you, you you don't want to be demand constrained. You want to be able to produce as many right. as you can make. And then you want to be able to sell as, you know, as many as you can. Um, and, you know, if you look at, if you compare, like, the ultimate comparison to me would be, like, if you compare something like P&G <laughs> to something like Tesla, right? Like, it's, it's, it, they're different accomplishments, right? But to be able to, yeah. to, to maximize your sales of, of something as, as innocuous as Toothpaste um, or mouthwash is, is really hard. There's a discipline to how they approach it, though. And I think that's the difference, yeah. right? You can have a mission, and if you don't, continually go back to that mission and say, okay, are these, is this product or this campaign or this message or this target in line with that mission? Um, then you're going to lose sort of the integrity of that mission, right? Or the focus of the mission. And the, you know, great brands like P&G, the reason that they can maximize sales on a toothpaste is because they're disciplined in the way they approach it. And they're in it for sort of, you know, for the most part, I'm sure they have products that aren't necessarily this way, but it's a long-term proposition versus yeah. a, yeah. I need to quickly capture this market share because that's the newest, it's sort of like the shiny ball. Like I'm going to follow the shiny ball and I'm going to get, you know, this incremental gain, but at that, you know, they're eroding the core of the brand. And I think the, the like really good long-term brands are constantly coming back to those missions or values or, gonna, you know, sort of whatever, whatever, you know, piece of paper they had on the first day that they wrote down, this is what we're trying to accomplish. And they, they, the brands live that. And and I think, you know, we were talking earlier about like, if you walk into some of these traditional category or traditional companies and you say, who's your target, who's your category, you could add to that, what's your mission? Like, what are you designing for? And they would also be able to tell you that, you know, and, and that, makes it easier for anyone in the organization, whether it be someone in innovation, design, research, strategy, you know, sales to be like, hey, this, this, I know the mission. I know how to sell this. I know how to talk about it. I know what's congruent with the values that the company is set up on. And it makes for a more cohesive conversation. And I think that's the big difference. Two companies could start with very strong mission statements, but lose it if they're not disciplined about, you know, coming back to that mission statement over and over again. Yeah. And the long-term discipline is hard. It's hard to learn at an organizational level, right? Because it, it requires a lot. And and it's funny, that's kind of what, what I notice about um, this, this, this lack of a shared category. Like, you know, if you think about it, like from a marketing perspective, that's like, you're, that's still the table, the contents of your book, right? Like you, you, you're, you, it's the title page. Like you haven't even, you haven't gotten to the meat of the book at all. Like, it's just like, what, who are you going after? Um, it's yeah. always amazing to me that like, it hasn't even been discussed at some companies. Like, and I'm not talking about little companies, like, you know, no one that right. I'm doing is small, like I'm talking about big companies that um, it, it's shocking to me sometimes where I'm like, wait a minute, like who, who are we, who's, who's your target? Like, who are you going after? Yeah. Like, who, like, you know, on a, on a broad level, like, um, and it, and it's really interesting. I, I would expect that that is, there's going to be, 
um, there's going to be examples of really sophisticated marketers that are going to come in and, and take share as these as these companies are are, are get more um, as the as the categories evolve and mature. Yeah, you're going to see people that this whole like you know the people that are writing books about like product product is the only thing that matters is like. No, like it's it's not it, it, like that. That that could work in an early stage environment, you know. But eventually, if you look at a mature category, like let's just use the toothpaste example again, you get to a point where they all work, right? And they all basically, right? You know. So now you have to find a a, a way to differentiate in a difficult category. Um, yeah, I mean that's that's where you have to like lay the tracks for your loyal your, your brand loyalty story, right? Um, yeah. But if you haven't like. I mean, it's not even laying the tracks. It's driving on the tracks, I guess, right? Because you should have laid the yeah, tracks. You have to decide where you, where you want to lay tracks, right? <laughs> like, you, have to, you have to decide what direction this train's going. We're going north, south, east, or west. How are right. we going? Why, why are we going there? Where are we going? Um, yeah, I, I think, too, the thing about the 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 reason that the we can point to an Apple, a Nike, a Disney, a Coke, a Pepsi, is that they have someone, and it either is the... CEO or the founder, or maybe it's a, you know, a group that is like actively policing in some way, uh, adherence to that initial mission or goals or target, right. As opposed to, um, and that, and sometimes that slows down the process. I always think about like the amazing thing about our portfolio of clients is that we have these traditional iconic companies, and then we have these really fast moving, um, innovative and, and they're all innovative, but like, you know, more these more tech companies that are um, sort of more, I don't know if nimble is the right word, but they're constantly adapting and evolving. And I think what's really interesting is that it's really amazing that the tech companies can move so fast and, you know, bring something to market so quickly. And there's something, you know, that the traditional companies can learn from sort of some of those models. But there's also something really amazing about these traditional companies that are disciplined in message and, you know, are thoughtful about how they expand their portfolio for the most part that the tech companies could really learn from. And so I think there's this, you know, if they could meet in the middle <laughs> and yeah. the traditional yeah. companies could pick up some speed and the tech companies could slow down a little bit, it would be really interesting to see what emerged because I, I it, it does sometimes feel... You know, when I look at the timelines for some of our more traditional clients versus some of the timelines that you're working on for tech, I'm like, wow, they're moving so fast. How do they even have time to figure out what they're doing? Um, and, you know, it's impressive a lot of times when when things get to market that fast and there's there are amazing benefits to it. But I agree with you. I think sometimes it, it's hard to see the strategy if you're going so fast um, and you're not stepping back to be like, why did we even make this product? What need does it actually solve? Is it these people we we would even consider customers or are we just chasing the next thing? Um, well, it's funny, like to use a sports analogy, right? Like if you go back, this is a really old school analogy, but if like if Paul Westfall is a basketball coach, the, his whole strategy was we're going to shoot as fast as we can. So we're, then we're going to score 140 points a game. It's totally fine if your strategy is fast, as long as all the players know that's the strategy and everybody's going in the same direction. Yeah. Right? And they know yeah. how to execute that, right? So like the way to shoot fast is a you know quick inbounds pass and then like the willingness to take a three-point shot, whatever it is. But, I, but that, when, you, when your strategy is go fast, but everybody goes in different directions, you're totally, you're, <laughs> I don't want to use the S word, but you're, you know, you are, <laughs> it's, it's, it's not going to work. Um, and, and that's, that's a, a great analogy. Like, right? <laughs> it's important that everyone's in shape enough to go fast, right? Like there's a lot of factors that have to be. Uh, <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of things that have to work out there. And it is. And that and I think that's one of the reasons that the category definition jumps off the page to me sometimes when people don't know, because I'm like, wow, like if, if you if you guys, if the, if the leadership hasn't decided what we're going after designing a strategy to go after it is a little hard, right? Like you need to know, like, what do you, what are we trying to do here? Are we trying to convert uh, this, this audience or that audience? And, and it's, it is, it's really interesting because so much of, of, of what some companies focus on is just discovery of new opportunities. And right. they, they send a bunch of, I'm trying to think of what the right analogy is to like, you know, like almost like fishing, you just throw your throw lines everywhere and, and see what comes back, which is, there's benefits to that too. Right. But um, absolutely. I mean, I think there's, there are tons of amazing innovations that have happened that way and have fulfilled like fundamental needs that we didn't even realize we had. Right. So I think there's room for that in any 
strategy. Um, but it, it, for me, a lot of times it comes back to this idea of like, there are these foundational pieces of research that you need to do as a company to figure out who you are and where you fit in a consumer's life stage, right? Because a lot of times one of the things that even, and I see this at very established companies, they have this idea of who they are and what need they fill that is not correct, <laughs> yeah. right? It is absolutely not how the consumer sees the category or the product or yeah. the positioning. And, and if you're not, if you don't have a method for figuring out that piece of the puzzle, then how in the world are you going to continue to innovate and meet needs of these consumers? And, you know, maybe you do your A and your attitudes and uses research and you figure out, yeah, you're perfectly positioned and everything is great. And, you know, you're like, why did we do that? We knew what we were doing. But a lot of times there's so much more nuance to it. And, you know, I see often companies putting consumers into these very siloed categories too, where they're like, this consumer wants X and this consumer wants Y. And it's not that simple. It's never that simple, right? Consumers yeah. aren't buying one product in one category and moving on to the next category to buy something. And so I think if you don't have a really solid understanding of who, like who's buying and wants your things, then how in the world are you going to continue to meet their needs? Um, so. Yeah, although I would, I would argue that if you're going to like build a brand you might have to oversimplify your target. Like to use the automobile, yeah. right? Like nobody yeah. buys a car just because they want a safe car or just because they want a fast car. You know, yeah. Just because they want a cheap car, right? You're, you're going to always weigh this. But if you want to be known as like the safest brand, like, you know. Yeah. I still think we might, one of my favorite ads of all time is the baby in the tire thing. Um, <laughs> which is pretty funny because a lot of people now probably don't even remember that because that was iconic from when I was young. But it's Michelin, you know, right? Yeah. That's the Michelin one, isn't it? Yeah, it's Michelin. And then they, they yeah. there's these amazing case studies. I think they probably still talk about it in business school. Michelin had that for, they ran that ad for seven years. I think they actually ran the same ad. It's not like they, I think they did yeah. some iterations of the campaign, but I think they basically ran like a lot of the same executions and it was so effective. And then they, they stopped, um, they felt like it was a little bit played and a competitor immediately started running basically the same ad and yeah. it worked like people should like it was like it was a very effective campaign it was just a you know i i you always you talk about in, in marketing stuff you always want to want to reach emotion right like you and that a baby and it, you know it, it effectively like gave people that like oh safety that that feeling and talk about yeah. a hard product to sell i mean establishing a brand in tires right you don't buy it that often and it is not like a warm and fuzzy feeling and you don't like, you know, it's not like you buy tires and then you're it's like, let's take these too, like, out. <laughs> so we used to, I used to, I've done a ton of tire research in my life, which is hilarious. I've, I've, at this point I've done research, kind of everything, but right? we used to do these ads where, I mean, these ads, these studies where um, way, way back in the day, we'd have to find people, people don't buy tires that often, right? If I remember a couple of years, they, they're not involved. It's a very difficult category to research. And then it's a very difficult, it's very difficult to go back and reconstruct why they made the decision right. to make right? Which is what we're always kind of trying to do. And we would, people would have to, we'd find people over the phone um, who had uh, recently bought tires and we'd ask them what they bought, what they considered this and things, but they had to go get off the phone. This is such an old school research thing. They had to get off the phone and go out to the car because of course no one knows like no the brand model size yes. and you know tire sizes are like r15 350 they're like it's millimeters it's you can't see it you know because it's black <laughs> on black but it was like the the most hilarious difficult research like it was it was such a fight but also like some incredible markers because it's like there is no easy path there there's no yeah. um and so you really have to know what you're doing and you really have to kind of be organized as a team. Um, and, and, you know, it's pretty crazy. So I'm actually kind of, it's, it's, it might be a sad part of our personality that we've been talking about categories uh, for, I know time. we really, in the I, it's probably like, no one is going to like, everyone's going to be like, what are you? I, I feel like we owe it to anyone who's made it this far <laughs> to give, them, <laughs> to give them some sense of like, what, you do like so if you found yourself in this situation where you 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 have you don't know what category you're in or what your target is like what do you do what, what do you do next and and i know there's a million you know, there's 
many paths to take and it's you know you're you're turning a ship basically so it takes a lot but like what do you what do you recommend or what are your thoughts on kind of like if i find myself here what happens next right and so it's funny it's that's an excellent that's an excellent you're you're an excellent moderator i can tell um Thank but you. it's funny because i early on in this conversation <laughs> i was like oh i find myself in this discussion a lot lately and it kind of blows my mind but to me everyone and i said it everyone's first instinct is we want to target everyone uh, we, they want it as wide as possible. Just like the the young founder who's trying to fundraise and wants to say that, you know, there's 400 million people out there that could use my, um, you know, stargazing app or whatever. Um, but really what you want is to narrowly define the lowest hanging fruit and who you, um, who you know you could convert at the highest level, right? Um, and and really hone in on who your target is. But the most important thing is if you have a, a company that's got hundreds, if not thousands of people working in some capacity around marketing, it's really important that as a team, not, not to overuse the sports analogies, but the team has to know what the playbook is, right? Yeah. What are what are we trying to do here? Are we trying to like, um, you know, attack? Are we trying to play defense? Are we trying to be efficient? And so there has to be a shared understanding of what, the goal is, and, that, and the first part of that goal is like, what is the category? And it's really, really important that people know from the highest level to the lowest level, hey, our category is people who do X, you know, this many times a month or Y this too many times a month or fit in this certain demographic profile. And you actually want to narrow that down so that you're focusing um, your resources on the easiest convert first, right? To kind of build the business. And then once you've totally locked down your your primary target, then you could start widening in concentric circles. But you always want to be very focused on who you're going after, um, and make sure you get them first. And and that yeah. I think that's a really important thing that that a lot of people they struggle with it at first. And and it, it, it you know it, it's 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 been you know kind of shown over and over again. Like if you think about it, you go back to Nike, just I want distance runners. Right. right. And so every ad is like this. You have like the, you obviously now Nike's in, you know, golf, tennis and, you know, leisure, every, they're in every single thing. But you, in the right. beginning, like you want to do a really good job of converting the person that you're most interested in and that you're built for. Right. And then, well, and they establish their credibility, which gave them the freedom to expand into those other areas. But you're right. I mean, they had a very focused objective in the in the beginning. And I think we had talked um many months ago about sort of um, segmentations and how to make the results of them actionable. And one of the big things that we talked about throughout that process is like, you have to get buy-in at every single level as you develop and create the segmentation and figure out who the priorities are. And, you know, I know that not every, every strategy decision is made from that segmentation, but it's the same thing, right? It's this idea of like, you have to be having these conversations at all levels of the organization so that everyone is moving in the same direction. And whether that's about a segmentation or, you know, need states or attitudes and usage, or even, you know, very tactical types of research. It's this idea of like our, our job as researchers or marketers is to make sure that we disseminate that information much further than our own departments or presentations. And I, and I think that, I mean, that leads into like all the other steps that we do, like the storytelling piece of it and the, creative deliverables and the, you know, the, the strategy conversations that hopefully we're having with our clients on a, on a regular basis. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's kind of a shameless sales pitch. I didn't mean to <laughs> I love it. Well, uh, I appreciate you, uh, you diving into this little dusty corner of marketing with me today. <laughs> I love it. I, love, I always love the dusty corners, right? You never know what you're going to find. <laughs> Do you have any category jokes? <laughs> you? Do you think there's like a, a little like dark corner of Twitter that's got like category jokes? I'm sure. Season marketers, you know. I I mean I mean it's probably like an extension of dad jokes, right? It's <laughs> exactly what what did David what did David Aker say about the category? I don't know. I'm I'm gonna write a category joke. I'm gonna work on it. I right. feel like maybe if you went back through like old Mad Men episodes, <laughs> there would be like some. They may not be very tasteful or politically correct, but there's got to be some category jokes in there. So you know, I think so that's, that's where you should mine. Thanks. <laughs> yep. Yeah, thank you. Bye.